Hello and welcome back to another episode of Psych and Guides. This time I am releasing a new guide for XCOM 2. I'm typically collecting questions that I'm seeing and I'm trying to find good answers for you guys. As always, the guide is trying to be comprehensive and as much on point as possible. Today's topic is going to be target selection, which is actually very important because you want to make sure that with the turns that you do have available, you're using them to the best of your abilities. Now, there is no linear or straightforward way of going into target selection. So what I did is I created an internal tier list and basically put every single enemy against each other in order to create kind of a normal distribution of whatever I would find on the battlefield would be most threatening and I, what I would want to go for. I will put a couple of caveats out there as we go through the list, because depending on your team constellation, some of it might change. We'll dive into it. So let's jump right into it. Tier one, which I called the category of top priority. There are really just a few enemies that always take precedence over each other and luckily each of them is mutually exclusive to one another. I put all of the rulers in that category simply due to their mechanic of having the actual ruler mechanic. So you don't want to let them have an unlimited amount of turns, which means whenever they are on the battlefield, you actually are forced to take care of them no matter what. A little pro tip, we're not talking about that in detail, but you might want to check out a couple of videos. I'll maybe even release a video guide on how to deal with rulers in particular, because I see a lot of players are struggling with them. So those are by far the biggest threats and without a shadow of a doubt, no matter what, I would uh, deal with them first. Moving on to tier category number two. In tier category number two, we're finding the urgent targets. Urgent, in my definition, is you typically want to go for them first for one reason or another. And the selection that I had here might surprise some of you. From left to right, they become more urgent. So uh, the chrysalids, in my perspective, outside of the rulers are potentially the most urgent enemies to deal with. Now, that comes with an asterisk, just like the asterisk around stun lances. If you do have uh, a very well-equipped uh, team uh, with melee capabilities and bladestorm, then that uh, definitely would go down. So say, I am running a team with a Ranger, Bladestorm Ranger and a Templar, for instance, and they stand side by side, effectively funneling each of the enemy melee combatants into them, uh, allowing for two Bladestorm attacks. Then, of course, this would not hold uh, true as much. The reason why the Chrysalids are on here is their poison continues to keep ticking. And if they ever kill some of your uh, operatives, essentially they reproduce. The reason why the stun lancers are on here is quite obvious as well, because they can one shot KO you. Although War of the Chosen has patched it in a way where officially, if you're at full health, you cannot go to unconscious, but you essentially just take damage. It doesn't always work like that. I've seen instances where you actually get KO'd from the first hit onwards. Now, granted, both of it can be countered with a specialist. And if you do have them on the team and enough armor, you might want to put them again down into the ranking. But assuming the standard distribution, those would be my top targets. The Sectopod made it onto this list in uh, third place simply for dealing the most damage, has a movement action and two attack actions, even though they sometimes are stupid and even though you can kind of uh, work around them by, for instance, shutting them down or uh, if they are ever indoors and hit a barrier where they can't erect, such as a landed UFO, then they become less dangerous because they don't get the high ground bonus. So other or bar those very special circumstances, you definitely want to deal with them first. Although they do have a lot of hit points, they unfortunately can one-shot KO most of your guys unless you are prepared. Also, fun fact, Lightning Field bypasses Templar's immunity and doesn't trigger Lightning uh, Bladestorm. Hence, uh, not even the Templar is a very great counter for them. Therefore, 
top priority pretty much always. Next up here would be the codex, and that might be surprising for many, and it goes back to a concept that I talk about, which is called momentum. Momentum describes your ability to continue with your turns. Momentum, for instance, a good example is if you forget to reload whenever you do have the opportunity, although you're not moving, you could theoretically reload and then shoot. That costs momentum later down the road, because let's say, um, turn or two turns later, you're going to find yourself needing to do stupid moves that add no value in removing enemies from the battlefield. And the Codex is a prime example of that. The Codex in itself with its psionic bomb will allow you to lose a lot of momentum. In its perfect placed uh, form, a psionic bomb can disable up to two, three, or even four of your operatives and their weapons if you do have a very clustered up uh, um, uh, setup and that will force you next round not only to move but also to reload or accept a lot of AOE damage. Either way it sucks, it is a very very strong ability and with their teleportation ability you can't even really overwatch it. Now granted there are a couple of ifs and buts. If you do run a lot of autoloaders like I do it and or if you do have an option to uh, take out uh, the codex via for instance a flashbang grenade then of course they are going to be lower in the ranking also if you are facing a lot of codices uh, say three plus i'm also putting them down, down lower in the ranking because i know that i won't be able to remove all of them hence one psionic bomb is anyways coming through so i do my best in trying to spread out and mitigate the impact nonetheless fighting against the codex is always net negative you never want to let them live for long and finally one of the chosen actually made it onto this list the assassin typically due to the raw damage output and her ability to kind of re-stealth and do a couple of moves at the same time typically makes it into the urgent list i actually thought to myself if i was to find uh, the assassin plus any of the other enemies would i eliminate any of the other enemies before turning to the assassin and the answer would be yes take it for what it's worth uh, that is how I would do the target priority. The assassin typically does have a lot of hit points and therefore isn't easily uh, burstable. So sometimes you are better off to simply deal with the other threats and let the assassin be. She typically doesn't deal a lot of damage. And fun fact, all of the Chosens can't kill you outright. They would just put you into the bleeding mode. Uh, so that's a feature of them. So although she deals a lot of damage, if you do have a good specialist, you can mitigate that. Good, moving on to tier number three. Tier number three is where the bell curve really is going to fatten up because we're now in the medium uh, tier. Eliminate next is what I called it. And essentially eliminate next is kind of the category where you put most of the targets that depending on your circumstances, on the situation and your team composition, you might want to eliminate next. You don't want to let them sit there for too long, but other targets take higher priority. So that's uh, approximately how I see it. I put in there a couple of uh, them that might be surprising in the way and the order that I put them. Number one, Max. Max in general take a rather higher spot on my needs to be cleared list. The reason for that is quite simple. I like high ground. If you're standing on high ground and or if you're standing right next to each other, mechs tend to have micro missiles. Micro missiles are having a huge range and are breaking the structure of buildings very, very nicely. So typical situation there for unexperienced commanders is that you will let them live. They will micro missile you. You will not only take the damage, but also the falling damage will be out of position. So a lot of the momentum topics that we talked about uh, with the codex are holding true here as well. The only reason why they are lower than the codex is the micromissile area of effect isn't as big and isn't always hurting you. If you're uh, staying on low ground, uh, the yeah urgency of the mechs is definitely reduced a little bit. You can drop them further down the list. Next up, Gatekeeper. Gatekeeper is on this list and not on the urgent target list for the simple fact that you can stun and or disorient them. In both cases, they can't use their most uh, prevalent ability, which is called uh, um, Gateway. Uh, if they can't use Gateway, they don't have this huge AOE damage. And on top of that, the dodge ability of them, plus their huge 
armor just makes them an inattractive target. So in terms of just general battle layout, it's oftentimes a fallacy where you're going to completely try to unload on the gatekeeper. You can't really get them down. And then in a return, you're not able to really deal with other enemies. Sometimes it is more efficient to take off more of the lower pieces from the battlefield and crowd control the bigger pieces. Gatekeepers are great in terms of getting crowd control. Therefore, they are um, kind of on the eliminate uh, next list, but not too high. Next up, two further chosen. Next up, the chosen. I put the hunter and the warlock here together as a pack. Typically, when I see them and none of the other urgent targets or targets that I just talked about are there, I would potentially go for them. They are tanky, therefore not higher in the list, which means opportunity cost, as I discussed before, but both of them have multiple actions once they are engaged. Specifically, the Warlock is notorious for summoning, then uh, trying to Mind Scorch, and then trying to Spectral Army, on top of uh, which he sometimes also does teleport. So he does have three to four actions, and that can really mess up the overall state of the game. Hence, in order to not uh, be at the receiving end, and sometimes I'm simply uh, focusing on making sure that those guys are down. Then I put a couple of, I would just say, mid-tier units together where it really depends on the circumstances and situations. And I tell you which of the circumstances in each case uh, puts them into a higher priority or into lower priority than what I've shown here. Um, each of them, of course, is in a higher priority when they are just exposed or in a better position. That kind of goes without saying. Mutants, I would put in a higher priority whenever they do still have their grenade and or are near to the front line simply because their slash also stuns and you want to then take them away. Vipers are in a higher priority whenever you are facing kind of long drawn out battles where they can use their tongue pull to get you kind of out of cover and immediately threaten you. They are lower priority when you do have hazmas, vests or simply immunity to their poison. Captains and normal troopers are always medium priority for me. They are the benchmark of just average priority. And then the faceless ones, they become higher priority whenever you are on high ground and they are in reach because they can and will jump up to higher elevations even if you're trying to block them. So you can't fully store them unless you're on a balcony or a tower of sorts and you have successfully um, occupied all of the fields. So whenever you're on higher elevation, it's the same logic as with the max. Then they can not only hit you and strike you, but their AOE attack will make it so that everybody falls down and therefore you get extra falling damage. So that would elevate them in their importance. They would be lower whenever they are out of reach and can't reach you yet. Very easy solution for them is, by the way, also flashbang because it reduces their movement radius drastically and then you can simply deal with them at a later turn. Next up, we're looking at tier number four, which I called lower priority. And really why this is lower priority is because you typically do have the opportunity to not immediately engage these characters. Then they will do their shtick, whatever it is. And then next round afterwards, you can follow up. So there is a very common fallacy that many of uh, the enemies that you will find here are over proportionally tanky if you immediately go for them. That sort of makes it uh, difficult to burst them down immediately. And then you leave yourself open and vulnerable for any of the enemies above on that list to come in. The easiest example of that is the sector and the trooper, which come in the early game. Many people go for the sector. That is, of course, wrong. You want to kill the trooper who is damage dealing and instead wait until the sector does his mind shenanigans. So each of uh, the ones that you see here kind of has their own shenanigans. The shield bearer is trying to supply everybody with extra shields. The sector is uh, going to try to mind spin and or reanimate. Those are his high priority actions whenever he can. The specter is trying to vanish after vanishing, uh, tries to shadow bind and after that is trying to horror in this particular order. So each of these actions short of horror um, are basically not helping Advent immediately because you can counter each of uh, them. Shadowbind in particular, if you are not running a healing spec um, specialist, then it's your own fault and you should 
watch a couple of my guides because I would explain to you that a shadow bind can be easily countered by uh, the um, revival protocol. And finally, the priest who typically tries to mind control and or uh, tries to holy warrior. In both of the cases, A, your mind shield will counter that and B, holy warrior, you can kill the priest and then on top of it, get a two for one kill. So either of those five, uh, four characters are essentially trying to do something that supports buffs or somewhat uh, crowd controls the team. Mostly you can counteract all of the crowd control sector uh, and Spectre in particular. If you are ever getting mind controlled, uh, bonds are helping against that as well. So just move next to your mind control target and the mind control drops. So there is actually no excuse for not letting these guys do, do what they want to do. Most of them will not even try to shoot at you. Towers are a little bit of a special case. Oftentimes towers just have poor aim. So if you do find your a situation where you can either uh, ignore the tower or where you're in full cover, then oftentimes I think they are stallable as they are not very good in aiming. Additionally, uh, it, it again depends on them. If you see towers on high ground and you do have a grenade, for me that's a easy first kill because it's a one shot kill that is guaranteed, no questions asked. So that would bump them up a little bit in the target order. If you can avoid line of sight and they are just overwatching, then they are bumped down in the uh, in target order. So that's really why they are in that weird spot. They are generally not as dangerous as the others. Let's move on to tier five. All right, tier five, or as it shall be known as can be stalled slash ignored. A couple of the um, entries here might be really, really surprising to you, but listen to it and hear me out first before you judge. Now, these entries are conditional and they really depend a bit on the game state and your team composition. So don't take it as an these here can always be ignored because you will uh, potentially be very unhappy. Number one, the Berserker. The Berserker is a strong enemy. If they come up close, they mean business. And I would slot the Berserker into tier three, just like the faceless one. However, there are a couple of major differences. Berserkers can't just jump up to higher elevations like the Chrysalids and the faceless ones can. So you can simply stay on top of a camper, a high ground, and just block the ladders to essentially prevent the Berserker from coming up. Is, it's a lame tactic, but it works. And who am I to judge what the Berserker can or cannot do? So just use it to your advantage. Whenever that is, however, not the case, you might want to use a flashbang in order to really make them store or try to stun them whenever possible. That typically takes them out as well. So you can store them for a couple of rounds before they become dangerous. Secondly, the purifier. The purifier only has a fire attack and if you are immune to fire, which if you are using Hasmus vests a lot or are uh, using a Templar with Fortress um, or any of the Psy operators with Fortress or the mech, uh, then you will not be affected by them at all. Ignore them at your leisure because they can literally not do anything against you. Specifically since I like using Templars a lot and specifically since I love having Fortress on them, they are just running in, they are ignoring them, uh, the uh, Purifier will try to shoot at them and they will accomplish exactly nothing. On top of that, the Purifier is very much uh, bad at aiming at people. So if you are wanting to tank them with an A protocol, for instance, that will give you a few rounds of just ignoring them. They can be counteracted because their damage isn't very high. And if you are capable of healing burning targets, then really I would even consider just letting them, uh, letting them be. Next up, the Andromedon, which really uh, is a strange place, second last, so almost lowest priority. Why is that the case? Now, here is the deal with the Andromedons, and this is very conditional. If you do not run with a Templar or have a way of regularly taking them out with stasis, stun, whatnot, then the Andromedon al already is lifted up to tier three, maybe even towards the left-hand side of tier three. 
The problem with the Andromedon is it is incredibly tanky and it is a fallacy of continuing to shoot at them. Their, their, their ability to take cover and their ability to have so much hit points plus their ability to kind of reanimate after they have been shot once will make it very difficult to get rid of them immediately. However, the Andromedon has a melee attack, which will mean that if you do have a Templar next to it, they will essentially try to hit him every single time and you can tank them for a very, very long time. So you're giving up your Templar's action economy at the cost of or at the benefit of getting the Andromedon out of the way, meaning the rest of your team can clean up the rest. And that's typically a fantastic trait. The problem with the Andromedon, and I will say that as well, is the Andromedon's main weapon is going to dish out a lot of damage. And they do have, I think, a plus five crit on that weapon. So if they ever manage to hit with that weapon and crit, there is one shot potential. Do really carefully assess how you deal with uh, the Andromedons because it can backfire on you. And then finally, the loss, not surprising for most of you, potentially that they are the last on the list. Loss can be stalled specifically around um, any form of letters. You can simply stay on top of the letter. The loss will not be able to get on top of it and you can shoot them down. Uh, you can lawn mow them if it is to your heart's desire. Unless you do have any mods installed that make them stronger, they are not really the most dangerous of all foes. Keep that in mind. This is uh, the tier list. So that is my priority for each of the targets. And now, of course, I'd like to hear from you. What did I get wrong? Are there any significant disagreements from your side? What do you think? Would you agree on that target list? Does it all make sense to you? Let me know in the comments down below. And as always, happy hunting, commanders. Take care and have a good one. Bye-bye.